The egghead incident just got better? Question mark. Full Luffy is back at full power, Bonnie has full control over the army of Pacifista, and we have a ship full of giants decimating those poor, poor marines. This is a proper Uno reverse. In one chapter, we've gone from the most dire situation possible, and we've gone and flipped it on the world government. Ha ha. And look, I don't know if I should be doing this, but I'm actually starting to have some hope that Egghead Island might result in a victory. However, we've still got a lot to overcome. Even more so than the giants arriving, the biggest flip in 1106 was Bonnie taking control of all of the Mark III pacifista. I do feel like this was a twist that most of us saw coming, although I personally always thought it would be an innate Kuma present within each pacifista that put Bonnie at the top of the hierarchy rather than Vegapunk actually programming her in. It's a beautiful gesture though. I love the idea that he took a stand here and made sure to solidify Kuma's legacy, to make it so that the one thing his effigies would never harm is Bonnie. It makes me look back on earlier Egghead events, specifically the moment with Police Kuma, and I guess what we have here is Bonnie's unfortunate choice of words, because she was begging Luffy to stop rather than begging the Kuma cop to stop. If Bonnie had said the word stop to him, than he would have. But that's the really sweet part about it. Bonnie's concern wasn't for herself. All she wanted was for her dad to stop getting hurt. So that's why her full focus was on preserving him and why she never accidentally asserted her command authority. But we finally reached the top of the hierarchy. There's no more strategic command games to play. And you're all probably getting tired of me saying this, but it just doesn't stop being perpetually true. Saint Saturn continues to dig his own grave one shovel at a time. In this case, Saturn didn't even consider for a second that he was not the absolute authority on the island. This is despite the fact that he was bragging to Vegapunk about her, I'm a scientist as well. I'll notice if you don't do it right. He didn't notice, some scientist he is. And secondly, he made the arrogant decision to keep the pacifista on Egghead Island during the Buster Call with his twisted desire to make sure that Bonnie gets killed by her assorted dads. And now he's facing the consequences. If he'd ordered all of his killing machines away, then they probably wouldn't have been able to hear Bonnie's command. Command. But now Bonnie has authority over, what is it, 50 Mark III Pacifista units? And I would assume the same goes for Esper as well. If Vegapunk felt the moral need to program the Pacifista this way, then surely the same goes for Esper as well. Also, did you know that all of the One Piece anime is available for free on YouTube? So long as you live in Japan, that is. Which I don't. Sore to more watashi wa. All I need is the sponsor of this video, CyberGhost VPN. One of the most recommended VPNs on Trustpilot, with over 38 million users able to access that, mmm, sweet, sweet One Piece. It's compatible with 40 plus major streaming platforms, including Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, Crunchyroll, Disney Plus, or BBC iPlayer, and you guessed it, YouTube. So you can surf the web with no limitation and never miss out on your favorite shows even if you travel abroad. You will never be blocked from accessing the things it is you want to access. It's not just about content though. CyberGhost VPN is easy and user-friendly, so friendly that with a single click, it hides your IP address, encrypts your data, and redirects all your traffic through a secure VPN and tunnel so that you can enjoy a better online experience right away, safer and more anonymous. CyberGhost VPN has over 10,000 servers located across 100 countries, meaning that you always have a reliable connection and they have an app for all major platforms, including Windows, Mac, iOS, Android, smart TVs, gaming consoles, and Linux. Plus a single CyberGhost VPN subscription can be used to protect up to seven devices at once. So you can and should check out CyberGhost VPN through my link in the description. There's a risk-free 45 day money back guarantee period. And by using my link, you can get 84 4% off, which is $2.10 per month plus four months free. And thanks so much again to CyberGhost VPN for sponsoring this video. It's because of sponsors like CyberGhost VPN that we're able to support all of our wonderful channel artists and editors. So definitely check them out. But for now, it's back to you, me. So this actually makes Bonnie one of the single most dangerous people in the world now. Even without Esper having command of 50 Mark III Pacifista is the kind of power that can conquer entire nations overnight. Not that Bonnie would do such a thing, but the world government's gonna have a rough time dealing with their own creations. Instead of fighting one mere lonely buccaneer, they've gone and essentially resurrected the entire race to take them down. A very kind of them to provide the tools for their own destruction. Now, speaking of destruction, Vegapunk's body is, well, it's fighting valiantly against the concept, but holding one's internal organs in becomes very difficult when impaled by a demonic spider leg. Again, if Saturn had done this earlier instead of taking the time to rub it in, then maybe Vegapunk wouldn't have had the time to tell Bonnie about the command thing. And 
you know that Sat knows it as well, because there's this close up of him where you can see the cracks of his eyes and the veins on his forehead. Look at those throbbing veins. And if Egghead Island were an internet forum, then this is where someone would inevitably pop up and say, are you triggered, bro? But as glad as I am to see Saturn reaping what he sowed, this is uh, it's a big owl for Vegapunk, possibly an unrecoverable owl, because I know this is one piece, but this is potentially the beginning of the end for him. I can very much see him going down the Whitebeard path of having lived a full long life, stacked with achievements, and then passing on the torch to the next generation. At the moment, he's also positioned in the, in the stereotypical dying way, bleeding out on the floor with Bonnie crouching over him. And it's not surprising because Shaka told us from the beginning that Vegapunk was gonna die. Well, I guess he may have meant Shaka, but also potentially Stella because Shaka is part of Stella who is going to die. Or maybe it was just Shaka. No, no, the whole seven people being one people thing gets confusing. But if Vegapunk were to die here, then I think he's had a good run. And all of the other, well, the other hymns can go on and continue his legacy. Now it's probably taken much longer than it should have, but this chapter gives us the moment we've been waiting for with Bonnie finally recognizing Luffy as the son god Nika, who her father told her about. In Bonnie's defense, she's a child. I don't know if I would have put these two things together as a child either, but I loved that one close up panel of the single tear in Bonnie's eye because it says so much with so little. Within this one tear is the confirmation that everything her father sacrificed had a purpose that has now been realized. And also Oda gives us a close up of Kuma's shell, conveniently positioned as if he's looking up at the sky, which is curious because in the previous shot we have of Kuma, he's on his knees on the rubber ground. So when I first saw the close up, I thought it was a shot of Kuma Kuma lying down on his back as if he'd fallen and landed on his back. That's not the case, he's on his knees. So Kuma is on his knees looking up at the sky, almost as if in prayer. And there's a lot of speculation about this little spark on his head because this sort of visual language is often used in manga and specifically in One Piece to convey a sudden realization, as if Kuma has just fully registered and confirmed Nika for the first time. Although I think it could just be an electrical effect as well because that's the part of his head that got blown away by Sakazuki. Either way, it's a powerful moment because I'm not religious, but from Bonnie's and I suppose Kuma's perspective, this is a seminal moment of seeing God, which I think is reinforced by Vegapunk completely dismissing the Buster Call. Because if you saw your God appear in the flesh, then yeah, what conjuring of mankind is going to be able to do anything against that? What weapon do you have that could possibly combat all of this sheer joy? And you know, if you think about Egghead from Luffy's track alone, he's not really been present for all of the big hard hitting dramas, which is fairly common in One Piece. Luffy doesn't need more reasons to fight. He sometimes acquires them, like when Tama wants to eat and she's not allowed to. Even though it's a very basic reason, he doesn't quite understand the full complexity of the Kozuki legacy, and he doesn't need to. It really just needs to be as simple as, hey, you didn't let the little girl eat, or hey, you hurt my navigator. Not good. And in a way, that's pretty perfect, because it allows him to be more carefree and liberated from the dramatic burden. He doesn't dwell on specific twisted acts. Like, he knows what's happening is serious, but that's no reason to stop having fun. Although I will admit it's a pretty stark contrast. When we have that beautiful panel of Bonnie seeing the classic Nika jump and you've got Luffy up in the sky having the time of his life whilst the island is burning down around him and Vegapunk is bleeding out on the floor. And I have seen some people complaining on the internet, imagine that, complaining that Luffy isn't taking the situation seriously enough. Bad main character, bad. But at the same time, that's what Joy Boy is. He's not really angry and angsty boy. Joy Boy is always smiling no matter what. Even in the most dire situation when you're dying on the floor and the world around you is collapsing, there the Joy Boy is, representing that there is still hope and that it's not entirely out of reach. That is what Luffy is. And he's not exactly slacking off whilst doing it either. I mean, the dude knocked an admiral out of the sky like he was swatting a fly. And he used the environmental awakening to save everyone, which was so cool. It was such an obvious but brilliant idea. If you can't stop people hitting the ground, then just make the ground rubber, easy fix. But what I love most is the Marines watching from the ships and just seeing the whole of Egghead Island shake like a big thing of jelly. It must be such a surreal experience. But Luffy mentions that he's back at full power after his degustation. So it looks like we're set up for a potential round two with Luffy versus Kizaru because it doesn't look like anyone else on the island is capable of standing up to him. I mean, Frankie and Sanji, they've been doing their best, but they're clearly outclassed here. Although if you look at the panel where Kizaru is attacking the Fallen group, it looks like Frankie did get struck by the attack, but to Sanji's credit, he managed to block it. And furthermore, it looks like he deliberately positioned himself to intercept any attacks aimed at Bonnie. 
so good on him. For the last many chapters, he's been the only member of the monster trio active on the front lines. So I definitely feel the need to express some Sanji appreciation. But looking at all of the things that are happening, it's probably about time that Saint Saturn did something because this situation is rapidly spiraling out of his control and we are nowhere, and I mean nowhere done with the bad news for him yet. Part of this has to do with what I'm gonna call a pretty blue balls moment in this chapter for sure. And I think we all know what it is. After that insanely hyped cliffhanger months and months ago, featuring the Iron Giant waking up, we finally catch up with it again. And in this chapter, he's just, well, he is just chilling. Dude heard the drums of liberation and said, eh, five more minutes and then five more after that and so on and so forth until he's late for work, which he is. We could really use his help right now, but you know what? That's fine because his giant co-workers, Dory and Proggy are picking up the slack. We'll get to them soon. But the fact that the giant is struggling to wake up makes me wonder exactly what it is he needs to fully power. Luffy being in gear fifth and hearing the drums of liberation on their own are not enough. It's almost like we need an entire orchestra playing the various sounds of liberation over a loudspeaker to give our robot friend the power to get up. Although the Iron Giant does raise an interesting parallel with Kuma. And in fact, the Iron Giant is on the same two page section as Kuma on his knees looking up at Luffy. So we've got these two robotic shells reacting to Luffy, taking on a life that neither should have access to. So perhaps our Iron Giant has some sort of connection to the Buccaneer race and whatever that special trait is that will be revealed eventually, maybe. So speaking of giants, I always expected that we would be going to Elbaf. What I did not expect was Elbaf coming to us. I said last week that one of the reasons why I love One Piece so much is that cliffhangers can have almost infinite possibilities that leads to endless organic discussion. And this is the best proof of that because the vast majority of people, including myself, were way, way off. If you told me last week that you thought that Dory and Broggy were coming to Egghead, then I would have dismissed that as terrible fan fiction. But here they are, and it's perfect. And you know, something I've never really thought about with Dory and Broggy is how out of time they are. They've been fighting on Little Garden for almost 102 years. Whole empires have risen and fallen in the time it's taken them to settle a squabble. Something else to keep in mind is that Dory and Broggy are 160 years old each, which means that they're in the prime of their lives. They're not in their adolescent 80s like Harudin, nor are they in their 300 plus elderly years like Jorul and Jarul. Dory and Broggy are smack back in the time period where a giant is in peak physical condition. And not only that, but they are coming to Egghead fresh from 102 years of nonstop training. These poor Marines are so, so screwed. I mean, what does anyone even do against Hakoku sovereignty? Bringing 100 ships to Egghead Island is almost doing us a favor because the sheer number of them makes them easier to line up and destroy in a single attack. I can't help but feel slightly called out by their dialogue though, because the Marines are quite rightfully surprised and asking, why are the giants here? We didn't prove predict this, just like me and all of the other readers. Well, I mean, someone probably did, but most of the readers. And it's almost like Dory and Broggy are pointing and laughing at us before saying, they're asking why we're here. <laughs> Obviously it's because of the sun god which also might speak to that disconnect that Dory and Broggy, and in fact, all of the giants have from the rest of the world. In all well government affiliated nations, the sun god has been stripped from history. And yet here, Dory and Broggy are saying, y you guys, didn't you learn about the sun god and giant school? <laughs> Education these days. The sun god, uh, that's obviously why we're here. And also probably why you're here, whether you realize it or not. I'm also wondering if this is why Dory and Broggy finally decided to end their feud, even if there was no official Victor, someone came to Little Garden and informed them that it was time for the Sun God's return, which is a matter that takes priority over the honor of Elbaf. That or the giants knew all along. Like Odin and the Roger Pirates, they knew exactly when Nika slash Joy Boy was going to appear again. And one day on Little Garden after another hard fought tie, Dory and Dobrogi said, hey, look at the time, we, we've got to go. And then after encountering Shanks on Elbaf, he informed the giants that Luffy had the fate some fruit. And when they saw the news of Luffy see Egghead, that's why they set sail. Although you'd have to believe that they would have gone to help Luffy even if they didn't know about Nika. But whatever it turns out to be, I am so thrilled with the convergence of threads happening here. Because up until recently, I wasn't sure if we would ever see Dory and Broggy away from Little Garden. It was a huge shock just to see them on Elbaf. At one point, I thought that all of One Piece was going to be a footnote in their century long feud. And of course the question I have now is, how many other giants have come to Egghead? We don't get a great look at it, but I believe the ship we see is the vessel of the original giant warrior pirates as a 
opposed to the new giant warrior pirates led by Harridan. It is a bit tricky to tell because the Jolly Rogers of both crews are mostly identical. One might even use the word plagiarism, but the new giant warrior pirates are just a modern rebrand. But when we did see a full shot of Harridan's ship, it appears to have a completely different front sail with what looks like a dragon on it. I also don't think the new giant warrior pirates were on Elbaf when we saw Shanks visit. So they're probably off elsewhere doing their own thing and this is an OG giant warrior pirates mission. And what I love about that is that even though the giant warrior pirates disbanded a century ago, the Marines of today still recognize their Jolly Roger. They were so powerful and influential that they made this echo of fear throughout time, an echo that still resonates with people today. And two other giants we can probably expect to see are Oimo and Kashi. They were members of the original crew and we did see them on Elbaf with Shanks. And it's pretty appropriate because the last time the Straw Hats interacted with them was also during a Buster Call. I don't know if this is what I should be excited for most, but I am really hyped to see Usopp's reaction to the Giants, especially since he's the one who bonded with them more than any other Straw Hat. I might be hoping for a bit too much because Elbaf has really put Usopp in the backseat, even more so than usual, but whether it's now or later, I think this is the start of a really good time for him. This also gives us the potential solution for how punk records get saved. I said previously that it would take a giant like Oz to carry the big old brain, and no, we didn't get that, but an entire crew of giants with a massive transport device is a pretty good second option. And I don't know if this is too much fictional pirate cope on my part, but are we actually looking at a situation where a Buster Call may be defeated for the first time? Earlier on in the chapter, you see the pacifista casually destroying five to six battleships in an instant. Each single pacifista has the power to destroy a ship. So you've got a hundred ships versus 50 pacifista. And even if you somehow get things down to a one-to-one -one ratio, that is half of the Marine fleet wiped out. And that's without even considering the giants up your butt. So I'm not even sure anymore. One chapter ago, I was close to 100% certain that Egghead was going to have a horrible ending where we'd all have to flee for our lives. But it may very well be the world government that has to retreat here. And what I think this is going to come down to is Saturn. He's the only real X factor that the Marines have going for them right now, and he still has yet to reveal the full extent of his power. But even then, he's gonna need something pretty serious to back this up. But if there's anyone I trust to ruin our fictional pirate fun, it's Saturn. He's not gonna stand there and just let all of this happen, although that's what he's been doing so far. Regardless, I'm going to continue preparing for the worst, because I think we might finally be at St. Saturn's breakpoint, where he needs to reveal exactly how the world government has maintained such an iron grip on power for the last millennia. And you should prepare by subscribing to this channel for consistent injections of One Piece culture administered directly into your YouTube feeds.